John's Gospel, chapter 2. Last week we talked about the first chapter. The first chapter has uh, some powerful, powerful words. It tells us of Jesus, and it tells us about his person. It tells us about his origins. There was never a time when he was not. It tells us about his glory, and we see him in the first chapter. He calls out his first disciples, and they follow him, which is what it means to be a disciple. And the story in, in chapter 1, it's, like, it, it's just building. And that's going to continue through chapter 2 and right on until we get to the story of the cross because everything about John's gospel is moving in those directions. In chapter 2, he's going to perform his first miracle, one of seven signs, seven things that, that point to the reality of the glory of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And, and John writes with such a clear purpose. We began the series a couple of weeks ago with a statement from John chapter 20 where the apostle, after he got to the end of telling the story of Jesus, he said, these things are written that you may believe. that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And believing, you might have life in his name. He, he has a specific purpose. He knows exactly where he wants the road to go, that we might believe. Now, just as a side note, and there's some discussion, are there 38 unique miracles in the Bible, or 37? Because some folks, uh, this, these are the things that Bible scholars debate about. Uh, that Jesus performed during his earthly ministry. Well, if you go with the 37 number, I want to read, just share this with you. Here's, here's how those miracles break out. There are 21 of Jesus' miracles recorded in Matthew's gospel, three of which are unique to Matthew. He's the only guy who tells about those. There are 19 of Jesus' miracles recorded in the gospel according to Mark. Two of those are unique to Mark. He's the only one that tells them. There are 22 of Jesus' miracles recorded in Luke, seven of which they're only going to show up in Luke. In John's gospel, there are eight of Jesus' miracles recorded, six of which are unique to John's gospel. So those are the miracles. And we're going to get a little doctrine of miracle today. When Jesus lived on earth, he made these astounding claims. Even 12 years old, he went to Jerusalem with his family. Remember how the story goes? They, they, they left. They, they traveled in a caravan. They're heading back now to Nazareth and with, a, with a big group, and they assumed Jesus was there. They discovered he was not, and they turn around. They have to head back to Jerusalem. They find Jesus, and Jesus tells them that I'm, uh, I'm doing my father's business. They're his earthly parents uh, caring for him, but he, his father is the Lord of heaven. And in his sermons, he says things. Through John's gospel, particularly, we get these I am statements. I am the light. I am the water of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. He, those big I am statements that he lays down are all declarations of his deity. He is God. So anytime you have someone say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, it's because they've never read God's word. Because over and over again, Jesus outright declared, I am God. So if he declares something that big and that bold, that he is God, then there's some things you'd expect, right? You're going to expect that if he claimed to be God, that he's going to do some things that only God could do. He's going to do some things that uh, ordinary folks just can't do. And if Jesus was really God, he was going to perform some miracles. And so he did. And here's what we find. Jesus healed the sick, walked on the water, raised the dead. And those miracles, how, what, what they do is they, they affirm, they support the claims to his deity. He can say, I'm God. But when he does these things, they affirm what he has taught. That he is truly God on this earth to save us from our sins. In John 14, uh, verse 11, Jesus said, Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I am God. Or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do. That the miracles that he did just affirm what he declared. But his miracles do more than just declare his deity they also provided him with an audience because people came. Some, they just wanted to see him perform something miraculous. Some people came because they needed something miraculous. But they came. And when they came, Jesus did these things, but they also got to hear his, 
hear his message. They got to hear him declare the truth of God in their generation and for all generations. And it gathered up a crowd of people. The opportunity to hear the forgiveness of sin. Opportunity for relationship to God and eternal life in heaven offered up by Christ. But the miracles were not just marketing tools to draw a crowd. Jesus didn't do it for that reason. The Bible says over and over again that Jesus genuinely cared about people. That's why he did the things that he did. Uh, one of the, my favorite phrases that refers to Jesus, he had compassion on them. He had compassion for the people. It wasn't just to draw a crowd so they could hear his teachings, so they could realize, have greater opportunity for faith in his deity. But he cares about the needs of life. And he cares about the needs of these lives. In the Bible, he cares about the needs of our lives. The Bible says he went ashore, he saw a large crowd, had compassion on them. And so he healed their sick. And then finally, Jesus' miracles helped to build up the faith of those who had already believed in him. He has these followers when we come out of chapter 1. They already have some belief. But this first miracle, the first sign in John that we're going to talk about today from chapter 2, it, it strengthened that resolve. It encouraged their faith. It, it fortified the belief that they had invested in him so that they, uh, they, could, they could stay true to the course. When they were in a boat and they thought they were going to die, Jesus calm in all circumstance, was asleep in the boat. They woke him up and said, we're about to die. Can't you help us? And Jesus calmed the wind and the waves and the storm. It says, and they, they, they did some believing. And that's what the miracles do. They strengthen our belief in who Jesus says he is and what Jesus has done. Now, that's a quick doctrine of miracle. Here's what happens to us. I've been in church my whole life. Many of you have been coming to church and you've heard sermons about just about everything imaginable in, in church over years. And we're so familiar with these stories. We've heard them so many times that we say, oh yeah, Jesus, Jesus is in a boat and he calmed a storm that uh, was about to kill them all. He just spoke and it stopped. Oh yeah, Jesus healed a blind man. Oh yeah, uh, Jesus raised the dead. And it's like just rolls, rolls off of our, our lips. Like that, this is a commonplace thing. Our amazement, I fear, has been dulled. But when you, when you see these stories that are so miraculous, we need to put ourselves in the, in the spot of the, of the people who saw them firsthand and how dramatic and impactful this was when they're standing there and somebody who is... Who is consumed by leprosy is suddenly completely healed what that does to you how it changes you so here's what happened in the bible because sometimes we do say oh but if i could see him firsthand that's i would be amazed if i if, if god was still doing it like that on an ongoing basis a regular basis where i could see it i go oh yeah now i believe but there's still a faith component because there were people who saw him firsthand who witnessed it Standing in the crowd, up close to where Jesus did these incredible things. And how did they respond? Some followed him. Some still doubted. And some wanted to destroy him, condemned him. And the same is true today. Everyone who hears the story of Jesus, everyone is going to respond in one of those ways. They're going to put all their faith in Jesus. They're going to believe in him, make a faith commitment to him. They're going to doubt. They're going to walk away. They're going to think they can do it another way. They can have a relationship to God on their own terms. And some people are going to reject him outright and say, it's a lot of foolishness I need no part of. And that's going to be true for everybody all the time through the ages. People are going to respond to Jesus. But here's the one thing about Jesus. You can't ignore him. Everybody has to decide. Everybody's going to be confronted by the gospel and have to decide, what will I do with Jesus? So here's Jesus. And he strides into their, into their hopeless situations with hope. And he has prophecies fulfilled. And he, he comes to draw people to the kingdom of God. And, and they can see him. This is the claim to the kingdom. He heals their friends. And he heals their relatives. 
And they're seeing it and they're witnessing it. They're hearing about it from people they know who were eyewitnesses. And they saw the power of God moving. And they'd read about these great miracles. Oh, so yeah, Moses and Joshua and Elijah, Daniel. We, 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 we've read those stories, but now it has come close. And now it's a reality all around them all the time. And the miracles were not ways for Jesus just to show off his power. But they vindicated his claims about himself. And about his teaching. And he didn't need to perform miracles, but he did. And when, when he performed the miracles, he didn't do it on demand. And he, we have examples in the Gospels of people asking for that. Okay, I've heard about the miracles. I've seen you do other miracles. We're here to see it. Lay down another one, and then I'll believe. Jesus didn't do this as a game. He was not a performer. He came that others might believe. And he performed miracles that others might believe. Now, John tells us about a miracle in Cana in Galilee. His first miracle. The first of the signs, the seven signs in John's gospel. And he says in verse 11, it revealed his glory. And that's where we're going to wrap this thing up. Where we're going to land this story. What were the purpose of the miracles? To reveal his glory. Now, we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 2, John's gospel. And keep your Bible open after we do this. Be sure and open up a Bible on this one because we're going to take this phrase by phrase as we, we go back through this passage here in a moment. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited uh, to the wedding and with his disciples. When, he, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you've kept a good wine until now. Verse 11. This is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Again, belief, believe, believing. Uh, that, that for, a form of that word occurs almost a hundred times in John's gospel. That they might believe is his purpose. Now, in chapter 2, we're moving from a verbal testimony about Jesus, which we got in chapter 1, by the works of Jesus. Now Jesus is going to affirm those, the, the teaching by further works of the miraculous. And what John does in his gospel is he'll go from Jesus' teaching, what he says, to his works. And then he'll do teaching and works. And he's going to alternate that theme all the way through the gospel to keep balancing them out that it's not just what he says, it's what he does. It's not just what he does, it's what he says. To declare that you might believe. And we see that in the first miracle in chapter 2. At the, end of this, at the end of this story, that verse 11 is really key. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Canaan and Galilee man, and manifested, made known, revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. John always puts the focus on Christ, the glory of Christ. His disciples saw his glory, and they believed. And that's why he writes the gospel. He wants to reveal the glory of Christ to us. He, he wants us to believe, to trust him, and not just in a few things, in everything. So we'll talk about how is the glory of Christ revealed in the story of the wedding at Cana. So here we go. We're going to work our way through the phrases of this story. Now, I'll give you a little background. Cana is a village. It's around nine miles from Nazareth, a little bit to the north of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. It's not a big place. 
we believe first century, it probably just had a few dozen people. It's a very small place. It's more of a place where people, farmers, gather up. It's a crossroads, just an area where there was a community of people, but not really a town. If they were going to need something, they were going to have to go to Nazareth to get it. So they were going to have to do a little traveling, do a little uh, trading post type stuff up in Nazareth. And it'd be also true that the town of Nazareth wasn't a big metropolitan area. We hear the names of these places and we wonder, wonder, wonder what life was like there and we project things onto it. Well, it's probably like Plano and Allen. No, oh, no, it's a few dozen people in Cana and maybe, maybe 500 people in Nazareth. Now, in an area like that, some of you grew up in small farming communities where there's a little community here, a little community there, and, uh, but you knew each other. You weren't that far away, and you, you branched out to be a part of a bigger community, and so you go, and you're a part of things. Well, in a wedding, that would pull these little communities together because they all knew each other. They farmed together, traded together. So they're going to come together for a wedding at Cana, and it's, it's a big deal. The community's probably all invited because most of them are probably related in a place like Cana. They're going to be connected with Nazareth, with the other Capernaum. The other places aren't too far away. And so we're not surprised by some of the people that are there. Uh, we're not surprised Nathaniel would be there. In, uh, he's just been called to be a disciple in chapter 1. Chapter 21, it's revealed Nathaniel's from Cana. So this is Nathaniel's hometown. Not surprised he'd be there. I'm not surprised Mary would be there. She's been living in Nazareth for a long time. She would have had plenty of connections in a place like Canaan, would have known people. Not surprised she'd be there. I'm not surprised the rest of the folks are there. The disciples, Jesus, Jesus' other, his brothers are mentioned as being there because everybody knew everybody. A lot of, a lot of back and forth. Someone from this village might marry someone from another village. That, that would be a common occurrence. And this is all in Galilee. Remember Galilee, up, up more in the northern part of uh, the country, the, near the Sea of Galilee. Then there's Judea down below. It's interesting that only a couple of the, mir the two of the miracles that John mentions happen in Galilee. John focuses almost all of his attentions on Judea. The other gospel writers, most of the miracle stories you're going to hear from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they happen in Galilee. In Galilee, Jesus had a lot warmer reception. This is a little more open, not quite so stuck as the area around Jerusalem, down Judea area. When Jesus goes to that direction, he's experiencing opposition every time he turns around. Everybody's after him. Everything is difficult. Everything's a fight. In Galilee, it's a little warmer. And it says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. I mentioned this as a side note. You, you, would, you would benefit from doing a study on third day. All the way through the Old Testament, there are references to the third day. Things happen over and over and over again on third days. And this is not by accident. The Spirit is inspiring these, God, these writers in the Bible books to record things that they do. It's like God just sprinkles things through. On the third day, on the third day, on the third day, on the third day, all through the Old Testament. And then you get to the New Testament, and there's still some more third day references. Because God's just, it's like he's just building a story. Because he said, and there's something really incredible that's going to happen on the third day one day. Don't miss the third day. Special things happen on third days in the Bible. And it wasn't just because of the wedding here. The wedding was important, but what Jesus does at the wedding, that's the big importance. And, and so the miracle's amazing. Beyond the miracle, uh, it's pretty important. Now I want you to uh, just give a footnote about this. Jesus' first miracle happens at a wedding. It's just a reminder that the covenant of marriage is precious to, to Jesus, that it's important, that it's special, sacred. Weddings matter. And... Maybe another message that we pick up from the fact that Jesus performs his first miracle, the first of the seven signs in John's gospel. He does it at a wedding. Is just a reminder 
that we think, well, Jesus is about a big mission trip. Jesus is about a worship service. Jesus is about these big, we think, spiritual things. But day-to-day life, man, let me tell you, Jesus is in the details of day-to-day. In, in the ordinary, common events that we, we are a part of day-to-day, Jesus is a part of those things. The third day. Now, the third day reference is actually that it's been the third day since uh, Jesus had his encounter with Nathaniel. So that's the precise reference on what's happened on the third day. And it's in Cana of Galilee. Again, hometown of Nathaniel, about nine miles, a little bit north of Nazareth. A simple, uh, simple little farming community. And the significance of Cana is its insignificance. It's just a backwater place. Any of you from a backwater place? Nobody could uh, name. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, lots, lots of folks. They come from a place where not many people have ever heard of it. It's not, not, not on anybody's map. God does some great things in places nobody's ever heard of, in simple places, quiet places. The significance of Cana is its insignificance. God's been doing this for a long time. He reaches out to a guy like Moses or like David or like Gideon, and he goes to places like Bethlehem or Nazareth or Cana to do these incredible things because God can make much out of small things. He does some of his greatest work in out-of-the-way places and makes uh, eternity touch such people, such places. Jesus will return to Cana uh, a little later on. In chapter 2, after this miracle takes place in Cana, Jesus goes to Jerusalem. It's the clean, first story of the cleansing of the temple, turning over the table of money changers. It's, a, it's quite a scene. And then he goes back to Cana. And there, this prominent guy comes to him from Capernaum and says... My son's dying, and I need you to come. But Jesus doesn't. He just speaks the word. Jesus speaks and heals him from Cana all the way in Capernaum. It says when the guy got back home, he found the son was healed. What time did it happen? The exact time Jesus said, your son is healed. So the first two of the signs in John's gospel are going to happen in Cana, a little out-of-the-way place. Now we have uh, Mary there, and uh, the fact that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is concerned about the lack of wine at the wedding. By the way, every time I say wine, because we're in a Baptist church, you you insert uh, Welch's grape juice into the story. It seems to indicate Jesus was, Mary was involved in the planning and organization of this wedding. She may be like a wedding coordinator. Uh, she, in fact, this may be a family member of theirs. She has, we're told in the Bible, Jesus has half brothers and half sisters. Could have been one of them getting married because Mary was very much in the middle of this wedding. Uh, we learn that uh, verse 12 That Jesus went down to Capernaum after he left here with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. Stayed there a few days. He is traveling with his brothers. I mean, his whole family was there. So they have a prominent position in what's taking place at this wedding. We don't know which disciples were present. We just know there were disciples there. We can sort of assume that it's the one Jesus just called. There's Andrew. There's Peter, there's Philip, there's Nathaniel, and there's the guy who always says, I'm an eyewitness to these events, but he doesn't name himself, and that's John the Apostle. So there's a pretty good chance those are the five disciples who are there. And Jesus' mother, you know, she appears in this gospel just two places in John's gospel. She appears here at the wedding in Cana. She's going to show up again at the cross. Uh, Not named either time, only as the mother of Jesus And Jesus, his mother, his brothers, they obviously know people in Cana. They wouldn't have crashed a wedding. They were invited to the wedding. It's friendly country uh, because they're in Galilee instead of Judea. And when the wine ran out, verse 3, 
These people are simple people. But they were expected, if you were hosting a wedding, you'd have plenty of food and drink for the duration, which is probably going to last about seven days. That you, You're going you're gonna to do whatever needs to be done. You're going to have more than you need. Everybody's going to be taken care of. Here's what happens. You don't have enough to care for the guests that are there, even if it's quite a few of them. It just brings terrible shame on your family, terrible shame on the bride, the groom, uh, the hosts. Uh, everybody is in a bind if things are running out. And they're not very far into the wedding ceremony, it would appear, this week-long adventure. And they have already run out. And Jesus' mother said to him, they have no wine. Now, it's not clear exactly what she had in mind. In verse 5, it's clear. She expected Jesus was going to do something. She didn't, uh, she didn't spell it out. She just declares the need. By the, time, by the time Jesus begins his public ministry, there's every reason to believe Joseph is no longer in the picture. He was probably several years older than Mary anyway, and because he's not mentioned, we're going to assume he has already died. Jesus, as the firstborn, has taken over responsibility to care for his mother and care for younger siblings. And so Mary's been going to Jesus for everything for a while. She has relied on him, trusted him to take care of things, and he probably has a pretty good record of handling problems. So she's confident he can handle this one. I like the way she approaches him, though. They have no wine. You know, those of you who are married, those of you who are not married need to learn this lesson quickly. Or those of you who have not learned it yet need to learn it quickly about communication in marriage. It's very important to a relationship. Uh, there, there are many times that, that I have encountered women in all sorts of ways who will communicate in this way. Mary says to Jesus, they have no wine. See, like I learned this early in marriage. If your wife says, the baby's diaper hasn't been changed. The yard needs to be mowed. The proper response is not, you have a keen sense of observation. Your observational skills are remarkable. She's telling you what she expects you to deal with. And uh, Mary was no different than with Jesus here. You know what's being asked. And Jesus responds, woman, what does this have to do with you and me? Literally, what to me and you? And it's, uh, it's not a disrespect. It's a distancing statement. And I want to dig into that a little bit. He's saying, what have I done to deserve this? Or what's my involvement in this? Why do I, why are you pulling me into this particular uh, circumstance? And it sounds to our uh, Western ears a little uncaring and disrespectful. That First of all, he addresses his mother as woman. Yet we find him using that same address with multiple women in the New Testament. And every time, there is never a tinge of disrespect to what he says. So it's just a part of uh, culture, language there. And it's distance, not disrespect in how he addresses his mother. In fact, uh, when Jesus is on the cross, he uses the same thing. Woman. With the, with the most tender care and concern for her well-being, he entrusts her to the Apostle John's care as he is about to die on the cross in his eternal mission of bringing salvation to the world. So Jesus' response is, is gentle, but it's distancing. And, and here's what I mean, that Jesus is communicating to Mary, I've really been your go-to guy, and I have been glad to do that. But Mary knew there's a big mission that's waiting, and it's going to come. And what Jesus says to her is, now I'm launching out publicly. So now it's all going to be different. And you're going to be cared for, but I can't be available for every need that's going to arise from this point forward. So that's the idea behind what's taking place here in this conversation. His mission to bring salvation is now game on. My hour, Jesus says, has not yet come, verse 4. His hour in John's gospel, as John communicates this, is glorification that he is going to He's going to die on the cross, be raised from the dead, ascend back into heaven, this big eternal mission. That's, that's the hour. But 
Cana is not the hour, but it's the beginning of the journey toward the hour, the first big intentional public step toward the hour of Jesus doing what God is, the Father has set him about to do on this earth. And, and Jesus just says, my hour means I'm on, I'm on the Father's timetable. I don't decide this. Mom, you're not deciding this. This is something that I'm going to follow this according to God's perfect plan. An example to us at multiple levels. And his mother said to the servants. This is the next thing. His mother says to the servants. Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there's nothing to indicate. He'd never performed a miracle up to this point. Nothing to indicate she expected him to perform a miracle. She just expected Jesus is going to know what to do. And she had confidence he would take care of what needed to be taken care of. To remedy a crisis and a wedding. So... There were six pots of water, stone pots, used for purification. This is lost to us in all kinds of ways. We're not used to this concept. But these rituals of purification were just a big deal for them culturally. And these stone pots would hold water that would accommodate even a wedding crowd for the time. If you visit Jerusalem today and there's the Temple Mount, you find these ruins all, the, all around the Temple Mount. And... It's purification baths. That Jesus' disciples, it says, and they went up to Jerusalem, and they entered the temple, and blah, blah, blah. They didn't just walk off the street into the temple, but they, they stopped, and they were a part of the ritual purification process before they would ever go into worship. And there were things related to before you eat, before you do anything. There were all these purification rites. So you're looking at this much Pots that size, 120 to 100, depending on the size of the pots, 120 to 180 gallons of water. That, that'd be about right for purification for all these people. If you're turning water into wine, that would be extravagant for this many people. And uh, I'm always amazed at the extravagant things God does far beyond what we could ever ask or imagine or think. Now, with these guys... Uh, <laughs> it says the servants they just obeyed Jesus and they filled up the, the pots until they were overflowing they had no idea what Jesus was going to do I don't know how well the servants would have known Jesus and uh, what, as I was reading it again this morning I was thinking about it that why did they just jump on this and they obeyed what Jesus said and Jesus didn't have a lot of uh, traction with them I wouldn't think and I really wonder if the reason they did it is because of Mary, who turned to the servants just before this and said, whatever he, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And they were so scared of Mary that they said, oh, we're filling these pots up all the way. That lady, that's one scary mama at a wedding. And they filled them all the way. And here's the other thing. It's no small task to fill almost 200 gallons of water into pots. They're having to go to a well, lower the rope down. These are deep wells because uh, bring them back up and then haul it and stick it in a water pot and then go do it again and again and again. So this is a huge task, but they, they do exactly what Jesus says to do. By the way, that's a good plan for a lot of things. Now, Jesus tells them, now draw some out and take it to the ruler of the feast. Take it to the guy who's in charge of this thing. Take it to the chief steward. He's in charge of the wine. And by the way, his head's on a platter on this whole deal too. He's in trouble because he's partly to blame for things coming up short. So he's in a bind, embarrassed, humiliated. And it says, the master of the feast tasted the water that had now become wine. He didn't know where it came from. The servants knew. Jesus works this miracle quietly. That guy knew there was a problem and now it's fixed. He didn't know how it was fixed. But probably Jesus' mother. Probably those core disciples we know they they knew because it strengthened their faith their belief in jesus and these servants knew jesus wasn't doing it for a big display he was doing it because he's a grace-filled savior in every circumstance of life and he says you've kept the good wine until now it was common you you brought out the the good wine early and then when senses were a bit dull then you brought out the stuff that was watered down the stuff of lower quality he says, this is what's so weird. The host says, you brought out the best wine at, at the end. Because Jesus always brings the best. The miracle made such an impression on Jesus' disciples. And they're new disciples. They haven't seen all these things taking place yet. But they're still willing to, 
follow, still willing to believe. One of the things they learned early on, and they learned it first in Cana, this core group of disciples, Jesus is going to be able to take care of us. He's going to take care of whatever we need at every level. This is the beginning, verse 11, of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. And we could have called this a miracle, but John calls it a sign. A sign is something that refers to a greater reality. It points to something that's even bigger and even better than they can imagine. A sign that points to this reality beyond itself. And in the Old and the New Testaments, we find signs and wonders taking place. That, that God validates His power, His presence, His glory in specific things. But if you read through the whole Bible, here's what else you'll find. They're not evenly distributed. You'll find a miracle here or a miracle there. Something that is definitely only God could do that in different places. But where miracles occur, they occur in clusters for the most part. At key moments of the revelation of who God is to the world. So when, when, when Moses is doing what Moses does, there is a huge cluster of miracles wrapped around that. And then on into the, the exodus and entering the promised land with Joshua. There's a cluster of miracles but then you go for a while that there, there's not as much miraculous. Just spattering uh, one here, one there. Then there's the Baal cult, the greatest threat to God's people in the Old Testament. The Baal cult just about wiped it out completely. Choking the life out of everything. And you have Elijah and Elisha. And there is a cluster of miracles wrapped around what they did to say. There is one true God and he is, he is the Lord, creator of heaven and earth. The God, the Yahweh. Uh, the I, the great I am. Then you get to the New Testament. And with Jesus and the early apostles, there's another cluster, a flurry of the miraculous to, to validate, to carry authority forward. And this is the Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now, signs and wonders. I just like this quote I picked up. Signs and wonders Crack open heaven just a bit to give earthbound people a glimpse of God's truth. Okay, now it's important to remember the glory of Christ, because that's the focus. This is what came out of it. The, he manifested his glory, verse 11. The glory of Christ did not begin at Cana. It was revealed at Cana. It was already there because he is the eternal one. Again, there was never a time when Jesus was not. The glory was already his. He had it with the Father before the foundations of the world. He has always been glorious, but now it is made known. So how is his glory made known in this miracle? Okay. That's the end of the introduction to the sermon. So now we're going to start in the outline and get to the sermon itself. Five things about how his glory is revealed in this miracle. I would suggest if you're writing these things down in your program outline, you write quickly. Number one, we see his glory in amazing graciousness. He did not choose to perform his first miracle in Rome or even in Jerusalem or with a company of really important people. He didn't seek honor from a big crowd. He... He came to dwell his flesh among us. And he came to the last, the least, the lost, the lonely. The people who are forgotten. The people who are outcast. People living on the margins. He, he's, he's not going to miss anybody. And he's not going to miss you in the sweep of his gracious care and concern. He loves you. Second thing. We see his glory in commitment to the Father's will. My time has not yet come. Every movement of Christ was aligned perfectly with the Father's plan. And if we're going to live life well, we're going to follow that plan too. And we're going to align ourselves with it. And we're not going to stray from it. We're going to seek that will of God first, foremost, always. God's timing and everything. Third thing, we see his glory in the perfection of his judgment. Mary said, whatever he says, just do that. Well, this is my encouragement to all of us today. Whatever Jesus has said, just do that. Life really works if we'll just do that. 
If we'll just do the things he told us to do, so many things that seem complicated become simple. So many things that are confusing become clear. Just do what he said to do, and things work out pretty well. We see his glory in caring concern. Verse 3 tells us that the wine ran out, and the following verses describe how Jesus relieved what was a humiliating, shame-filled, difficult, social cultural situation and what that tells me and this is not there was a man blind from birth and Jesus healed him and he the blind man could see there was a there was a man demon possessed and destructive to himself and others and Jesus delivered him there was there was a guy named Lazarus who was dead for four days and Jesus raised him from the dead those are big sweeping things this we have a little faux pas going on at a wedding. And Jesus cared about that too. He cares about the big, sweeping, awe-inspiring landscape kind of crises in the world. And he cares about you being sick or needing a job or relationship struggles, uh, grief, all the things that, that just... Just knock us around in life. Maybe they knock us down. Maybe they just bruise us up a bit. But Jesus cares about all those things too. Fifth, we see his glory in revealed power. And how simple was this miracle for him? He just, he gives a command. He speaks. And his power to do great things is still the same. He still does miraculous things, and we still have evidence of miracles when we pray and uh, w when we trust God to see him do incredible things in the world in which we live. But the greatest miracle of all is still going to be when sinners are transformed into saints, when, when a destiny of hell becomes a destiny of heaven. That, that miracle is so incredible and, and so, so sweeping and so forever. And he still does those miracles. The result of the Lord's glory being shown is indicated in verse 11. His disciples put their faith in him. Now here's, here's the other part that I want you to see. He did these things that people would take a first step of believing in him. That they would, they would step away from unbelief, from lostness. And they would say, I'm putting all my faith in Jesus. And some of you today, that's a step that you have to take. He's inviting us. And you can walk away from it. You can, you can deny it. Or you can just say yes. And this is why he does it, to surrender your life to him. To say, I'm going to follow him with all my heart for all my days. Not just, he's Jesus. Yeah, I lived a long time ago, did some great stuff. But that we're amazed by this grace. And it changes us, transforms us. That you would today put all your faith, that you would believe. This is why the whole book is written of John's gospel. That you might believe. But here's the other part. These disciples, they had already said, I'm going to follow him. They had already said they believe. But they just needed a booster shot of that. And it happens over and over that, that Jesus does another sign. Something else happens. And, and they're just a little stronger and a little more stable and a little more focused as he keeps adding those things on. And some of you today, uh, this is the thing. This is what I felt in a couple of areas of my own life and my praying about today I trust God, <laughs> like, like many of you, you'd say, I trust Jesus for my eternal salvation. He died on the cross, raised from the dead. I trust him for my eternity in heaven. But man, when it comes to trusting for my kids, I really can't do that very well. I'm going to have to manage that myself. I trust him for my eternal salvation, but, <sighs> but what, about, what about the bad report from the doctor? What about the job need? What about... He's in the details. And he cares about all those things too. And he is able. And, and these things are written that you might believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And believing you might have life in his name. Maybe it's the eternal life. Maybe it's the abundant life. That he intends for you. But that you might believe. My challenge to you. Believe.